now 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 it's a bit of a uh, okay I have to get um, good afternoon everyone this is sims gardner the director of the center for art design and visual culture and today it gives me great pleasure to introduce kathy marmer's lecture uh, for the 2022 spectrum visual arts faculty uh, biennial exhibition it's our last one of this year's and we're extremely pleased also uh, introduce along with Kathy, uh, Robin Fairbow and Penny Regans, Regans, excuse me. And these are collaborators with Kathy who, uh, it's a wonderful exhibition of work and I really encourage everybody to come see it. And I, Kathy wanted me to keep it brief today because she's gonna talk a lot about her practice within her lecture and you are very, the audience is very lucky to be able to uh, listen to Penny and Robin as well. Great uh, people at UMBC and really interesting collaborations taking place with Kathy's uh, uh, component within the exhibition space. Um, so thank you and uh, let's go Kathy. This is gonna be great. <laughs> thank you, thank you so much. I just wanna say thank you Sims <laughs> for everything and obviously for being so patient with us today <laughs> as we negotiated a very big presentation <laughs> and, and a bunch of slower browsers. But I'm really delighted to be here. And again, I apologize for all that kerfuffle at the beginning, but hopefully we'll be able to do smooth selling from now on. Um, but I really wanted to also thank you for the opportunity to exhibit the work. And I'm really, really, really honored to exhibit alongside two other exceptional artists. And while we're in this sort of thing of thank you, thank you, I'd also like to really thank Sandra Abbott, who's the curator of collections and communications, and of course, Mitch Noah, right, um, who's the exhibitions coordinator. And I really want to give a, a shout out to uh, Madeline Arbutus, who designed that very beautiful exhibition line. So um, that's what I'd like to say um, and say thank you. And then I wanted to also say, we are so delighted to be here with the wrestling that we've done. We are here, hello. And to also at the same time, I wanna extend a welcome and thank you everybody for your incredible patience as we tossed with our, our, our uh, very big presentation that would not go through a browser. Um, so what I'm gonna do at the beginning is just to give you an introduction to my collaborators, which is Robin Fairbaugh, say hi Robin, yeah. and Penny Reingens, Say hi, great. <laughs> I'm delighted to see you both here. It's just fabulous that we could do it. Um, so with my introduction, I'm gonna start with Dr. Fairbaugh. Dr. Fairbaugh and I worked together on Philomela's Thread, a commonplace book. Um, Dr. Fairbaugh's research focuses on the writing of early mo modern women and the politics of early modern drama. She's taught a wide array of subjects in the English department and in partnership with the Department of History at the UMBC. Um, she also writes both fiction and creative essays. I can take my, uh, my uh, headphones off. <laughs> um, Dr. Reinigans and I work together actually on in schooling. Um, Dr. Reinigans is a computer scientist whose research focuses on data visualization, computing, education, and broadening participation in computing. Uh, while she was here with us at UMBC, uh, she uh, was also the director of the Center for Women and Technology. Uh, in 2018, we lost her and she became the director of the University of Maine School of Computing and Information Science. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm actually gonna try to start my screen and share with you the PowerPoint presentation. And then I'm gonna give a little bit of a summary and then both Penny and um, Robin will talk about their participation in the projects. So I'm gonna hope that this works.
Can everybody see that? Is it, am I good to go? I'm good to go. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's the title slide at least, <laughs> and now we'll move along with the talk. <laughs> um, so, um, oh, actually, if um, Jason, I don't know if you can, but if you would, wouldn't mind, if you could post the link um, to the uh, CDBAC uh, exhibition, that would be great because people can have a look at the exhibition. If not, I'll do it in a little bit when I get a chance to uh, take my screen back. Um, but anyway, so there are these two collaborators. These um, two collaborative works that I'm showing now on the left is unspooling and then on the right is Philomela's thread, a commonplace book. Um, that these two wor works were an awarded a strategic award um, for research transitions in 2018. So I'm really grateful for this award because that they were um, it, it was extremely central to both their making and their comp and their completion. The awards uh, goals really aligned with my intentions uh, in creating the pieces, because really I wanted to pursue a new line of inquiry in my research, and I needed to reestablish myself after a terrible illness, and I really wanted to be involved in an interdisciplinary collaboration. Um, and, and part of that was because <laughs> about my past work. My past work really centered on the use of technology and it accentuated uh, our physical interactions with it. Um, I was, I was, and I'm still very interested in how technology mediates our sense of self. However, when I was developing this work, The Messengers, which was done in 2013, I was working with a fabricator, a, a programmer, as well as an electrical uh, engineer. And uh, as the project developed, I just realized that sort of this techno fatigue was setting in. Um, and then after I completed the project, I found that what was going on for me was that technology was changing so much. Um, and the fact that big technology, that big, com big tech companies were cons concentrating their control and interacting with computers became part of absolutely everyday life. And I found that for myself, I was really unable to keep up with the pace of technological change. Um, so I also realized as, again, as this work was completed, that I didn't even really have the necessary technical skills to keep this piece operational. So, as I finished up and sort of started to think about things, it was so clear to me that I actually needed a break from technology, needed to kind of move away from it in a way. So, um, I've always used print uh, making, I've always made uh, digital prints and they've always been sort of part of my process. Um, and one of the things that uh, was important to me was that I returned to it in 2015. And I created a series of prints um, entitled Vida that were actually extremely personal. Um, they represented deaths um, in my family and my illness. And what I'm showing you now is a work uh, entitled 1926 to 2013, and it commemorates uh, my father's life and death. So uh, for me, the works that you're going to be, we're going to be talking about, you're going to be seeing in more detail um, in Beyond Midlife really continued in this very uh, personal vein. So in 2014, my mom moved in, moved to be closer to me and I became her caregiver. And unfortunately in 2018, my mom died. And, you know, it was really hard. I really grieved for her. But I also at the same time really grieved for all she had lost. And she had really lost a lot. Um, she lost her home because she moved away, her husband, my dad, of course, one of her sons, her mobility and her independence. So being with my mom and going over to see her um, twice a week, it really started to make me think a lot about aging. And then of course my aging. <laughs> 
and um, then my own mortality. So like I had done for my dad, I really wanted to recognize her life too. So that's when I decided that I wanted to work with women who are my, who are my own age, my age, and whose expertise and experience uh, would bring a lot to the project. So it was, it was really my hope that uh, the collaboration with Penny and with Robin um, would really init initiate discussions about being middle aged and beyond. Uh, but I really, I soon discovered and, and should have known this, that it's actually very difficult to talk about aging. And especially in a society that really wants us to uh, age successfully. And yeah, I really did discover that there is no one universal notion or attitude about aging. So the next set of slides that are going to show you are really important visual touchstones for the project. Um, the one on the left is what I'm going to talk about first. That's Suzanne Valadon's work, The Blue Room. Um, I really love her painting. I love it a lot. But her painting really defies traditional notions of femininity and upends the patriarchal and colonial trope of the nude woman reclining seductively in bed. So in her blue room, uh, what uh, Valadon does, which I think is so exciting, is that she presents us with an authentic modern woman. And as you can see, a woman that reads. Um, I also really appreciated her self-portrait uh, done in 1927, and I find it equally as refreshing. Um, it's really uh, refreshing, especially for its frankness and its candidness. The next set of paintings I'm going to show are by Joan Simmel. And her work, actually, you can still see it. It's up. Um, it's currently on exhibition at the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts. She photographs her own 89-year-old body and renders herself naked uh, through paint. And I love this quote. As she writes, the issues of the body from desire to aging as well as those of identity and cultural imprinting have been the core of my concerns. The cardinal nature of paint has seemed to me a perfect metaphor, the specifics of image, a necessary elaboration. So, <laughs> time, the body, life experiences, and the notion of a presence of self are really central themes in Beyond Midlife. And these themes converge in the strands of thread that we've employed both metaphorically and, lyric and literally in the two works. So I wanted to show this because this is really important um, to my work, but I think it's really interesting. So in her book, Fray, Art and Textile Politics, Julia Bryan Wilson quotes Grisby's argument that these photographs here of Sojourner Truth Knitting are a form of mindful and strategic self-authentication, one that is akin to the hand-drawn or scribbled signature. Her activism is really alive through her handiwork. So throughout history, women have told their stories um, in their quilting, embroidery, and knitting. And these textile crafts can actually be thought of as a form of, self, of soft power. So in our works, what we wanted to do was shift aging women from the margins and then bring them back so that they're now central characters in their own epic stories. We are really using thread to persuade you to rethink this notion of aging. Of aging. And then, so now what I'm going to do is just show you a couple of other interesting examples of using craft as a form of, self power, of, of soft power. So um, I really like this um, image on the left of yarn, of yarn bomb, the yarn bomb le leopard one tank, which was done by Christian Cromer and Barbara Nicholas. Um, and then, of course, you're probably familiar with that pussy hat <laughs> that yeah, we all wore to the Women's March. Um, it was conceived um, by, the, uh, by Zweiman and Sue in 2017. And the pattern itself was designed by Pat Cole. Um, elsewhere, feminist 
um, artists have also employed craft as a means to express the political and subversive potential of the female example. And I, I, I've included a couple of examples um, because I think that they're so terrific and really interesting how they speak to each other. So on the left is Faith Welding's Crocheted Environment, um, 1972, and then that lovely one, Mr. Slit by Sheila Pepe um, in 2007. So now I'm going to go on, seeing that I've given you a little bit of context, I'm going to talk a little bit about our collaborations and the works that each of us worked on together. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about my collaboration with Penny. Um, when I first met Penny, um, I was looking for a grad student to do some programming for me. Um, but I've always wanted to work for her. It's really important. And so I was really excited in 2017 that it seemed like our timing was finally right. Um, uh, I was aware, and I've always been aware, especially of this book by Sadie Plant, about the connection between uh, computing and weaving. And luckily for me, Penny likes to weave and knit. So we start to talk about creating a fiber work instead of uh, collaborating digitally. Um, our conversations eventually led to the work on spooling. So this is the work on spooling. Um, so for us, knitting really suggested the body and each of the four works represents a vulnerability. Um, I'm also completely a novice when it comes to working with textiles. Uh, I can say that there were a lot of false starts and quite a few do-overs. But, you know, one of the things that I found was that eventually it really helped me to think of them more as three-dimensional drawings. It sort of led me, gave me a way to get into inside to think about how to structure them. Um, so, really, knitting is a pattern of stitches um, that's repeated in rows over and over. But there's always this nice probability of disorder, a drop stitch that can quickly unravel, especially when gravity takes over. So the on the left, I hope I'm saying that right. You can see it on the left, right? <laughs> That's cognition. <laughs> so uh, the left, on the left is uh, the this first form is called cognition, or that's kind of the thematic construct that we were using. Um, it, to me, it's an imagined world of brain nerve cells um, interrupted by plaques and tangles. Uh, the frame holes they're not they're not just uh, structural, but they're also spaces that mark disruption. As I worked on it, I was always constantly thinking about the transience of memory and our struggles sort of to retain it. I, I wanted to quietly evoke a sense of failing communication. Penny, did you want to speak a little bit about yes. it? Uh, so I've long found knitting to be a balance for my work in computer science, uh, where the tactile creative process of knitting provides a counterpoint to the rather abstract creative process of coding. Uh, before this project, though, my knitting had always taken a rather practical turn. So I had made scarves or sweaters or or toys for the, the various children in my life. And now I turned my needles to expression rather than warmth. So just as I had used texture before in my data visualization work to represent numbers, I used texture and yarn to represent concepts. Uh, some processes now, some pieces displayed the, the regular pattern of even perfect stitches, while others contained holes and drop stitches to su suggest disintegration. I discovered um, intentionally creating mistakes is much harder than one would expect. Um, I also discovered that knitting hyperbolic surfaces to subject sprains was really great fun, particularly to tell people what you were doing. Um, my knitted fragments, they were silly and they were spontaneous, but they came together to be something thoughtful and intentional. And that was sort of the, the beauty of how Kathy put things together. Thank you. Great. 
So I'm going to talk a little bit more about the one on the right hand side, <laughs> which is again, thematically structured under the notion of a, a sexual reproduction. Um, it became clear after competing after completing cognition that I needed to change my materials and uh, my tactics. So, instead of sort of repeating that cellular density from cognition, I started to use the crafters organizational pegboard as a pattern surface. It for me became sort of a type of skin um, and the pattern, the dotted pattern soon migrated to the patterns of the cutout paper that form both the shapes of the breasts as well as the vagina's labia. So, I'm going to show the next 2 works together. Um, this one on the left is appearance. Um, and then uh, again, <laughs> I changed yet again my use of textiles. Um, that uh, for me, uh, I, I wanted to tilt the work a little bit more towards this notion or the concept of adornment. And um, it was really to reflect uh, the desire of me to hold on desperately to something that I felt as I age was slipping out of my grasp. Um, in fact, it's kind of a funny story that almost every, um, on every milestone birthday, I kind of buy either a new lipstick or some sort of expensive jar of face cream that I never ever actually use. So the right, the, the image on the right is um, from, uh, or is titled self. Um, and it seems like it's such a great title because actually that is indeed what is unspooling. The dowels that I made are actually what I would call inverted drop spindles that are set sort of so elegantly and beautifully against um, Penny's, uh, Penny's shroud of knitting. Um, so you can see, um, at, 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 as you can see, the works themselves seem all together. You can see them on one at a time or sort of as a group of pieces that they really seem to be in the process of unspooling. Um, it really came, became clear to me that as I was making them, that what I was doing was about what the core of it was, was that it was really about our notion of making or our making and then are unmaking. And in that unmaking, there is this really profound sense of loss. When Kathy and I began this collaboration, I was still at UMBC. We'd gather in a conference room to trade pictures and patterns and possibilities. We rummaged through my very large stores of craft supplies to find inspiration. And we visited the Maryland Sheep and Wool Festival to find a few perfect things to add in. Uh, we swapped materials um, in and out to, to try to capture an evolving set of concepts as our ideas changed. When I moved to Maine, the mechanisms of our collaboration changed. Kathy would call or she'd text with some request for some new conceptual piece. And I would struggle to extract information about color or size or texture out of her, these specifics. Um, a raft of snapshots went back and forth and back and forth. Um, and um, along with boxes that contained uh, color or yarn in colors she had requested, some glass forms that never quite seemed to fit into this project, or uh, lots and lots of knitted patches in all sorts of colors and textures. And finally, a long, long knit mesh that Kathy calls a shroud that seemed to take four freaking ever to knit. Um, I crafted random bits and Kathy assembled them into meaning. The, the pictures that flowed back and forth were increasingly complex, but they never seemed quite real to me. The, the complete concept never quite snapped into place until I stood in the gallery and saw the assembled piece in place. Yeah. Uh, I have to say, Penny, it was really a treat to have you here. Um, Robin had seen it as we were sort of in the process with it. And mm -hmm. then it was such a really nice thing for you both to actually be here and to be able to see the pieces up in the gallery. Absolutely. Really terrific. <laughs> Thank you so much, Penny. 
I'm going to bring us now into Robin's uh, contribution and our participation together on uh, the uh, Philomela Strad Commonplace book. And Robin, just let me know when you'd like to uh, share or interrupt as I go along. Please, by all means, do. <laughs> okay, well, you let me know. I, we'll we'll make that two ways. You want to if you want to turn to me at some point and say, okay, I, I'm going to sit back <laughs> for it, whenever. <laughs> Okay, so um, one of the things that I discovered as we were, were as I was doing research for both pieces was that text derives from the Latin Texas of tissue, um, which is uh, which is in turn derived from the word texture to weave. It belongs to the field of associated linguistic values that includes weaving that which is woven and, and spinning and that which is spun. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Okay. Oh, there we go. So in 2016, I started creating a bunch of digital uh, drawings that use simple lines to tell a story. Um, I wanted to uh, work with a writer, so I approached Robin, thank you, um, to see if she might be interested in collaborating on the work together. Um, you know, Robin, I have to thank you for really introducing me to the history of, of commonplace books. And I wondered if you wanted at this point to talk a little bit about them. Sure. Um, commonplace books are um, things that, that men uh, have kept for a very, very long time. Hamlet refers to one that he's keeping. And in, in, in among men who were educated, it was just a storehouse of wit a, a wisdom that they wanted to keep in one common place. Well, when women became literate, they started occasionally keeping them too, and theirs were varied. They had, as you see in the, the slide here, they, they put all kinds of things. It wasn't a scrapbook, it wasn't a diary, it wasn't a compendium of recipes. It was sort of a bunch of all kinds of things, like accounts sometimes, or handwriting practice, or um, letters, all kinds of things, and as well as the kinds of wit and wisdom, you know, quotes from poets, um, bits of sermons and so on that they wanted to hang on to. Um, what it meant for women, well, for those of us who study the work of early modern women was uh, pictures of, of rounder lives than we had ever imagined before. It's not that we didn't think women had rounder lives, but we didn't know what they were like. And it turns out these women were pretty interesting. Um, if that Lady Anne Southall that you see up in the upper right of that slide is actually considered an, uh, an author now. We've, we've gone, I mean, an author in the sense that we would study her writing, we would consider her as someone who is part of the early modern female canon of materials that, that, are, that are important. Um, so what we've done uh, through through these the study of early modern women's works, including commonplace books, um, is to discover um, a whole new world of women who thought deeply, seriously, and um, com with commitment to the world that they lived in, uh, despite their being you know are not knowing about it for years and years. So that's commonplace books. Great, thank you so much. I'm going to continue from there and talk, oops, and continue from there to talk a little bit about the piece itself. Um, so, for us, as um, Robin so uh, beautifully talked about, that um, the commonplace books really became a, a metaphorical vehicle in which uh, a, a strand of thread uh, actually travels across many pages and ends up being looped into a handwriting. Um, the thread really gives a voice to women's lived experiences. So mm -hmm. the next thing I'm gonna show, did you wanna talk about them? A little well, bit? whenever, yeah. you, you, go go ahead. Ahead. you go, I'll go. <laughs> oh. <laughs> you want me to? Yeah, which, Well, the, the, I was just, the, the slide that you had up before about text and text array, um, uh, text evolving from the verb to weave is actually a fascinating, a fascinating connection. Um, 
for two reasons. One of which is the notion that you weave a story. That metaphor stays has stayed with us. You know, the common thread of these mysteries or the common thread of this paragraph. We think about weaving as um, we, it's, we don't even think about it as something special in terms of metaphor anymore. We use it so commonly. And it's always been like that, as far as we know. Um, in, in ancient and in classical Greece, um, which was a, a period of time that the early modern woman would have known something about, that was very important to their education. Um, um, uh, they, 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 we, we have lots of images of women weaving, beginning with the three sisters of fate who spin, measure, and cut the thread of life. We have um, Ariadne, who is seduced by Theseus, bad boy Theseus, um, and she gives him a ball of yarn to find his way out of the labyrinth. And we have Penelope, Odysseus's wit, well, she thought she might not be his widow, so she hung on. And how did she hang on? She wove all day and said to her suitors, I can't marry you until this is done. And then at night, she would unravel everything she had done. So the weaving became a form of power for her, a way of controlling an environment that was really pretty heavily controlled by men. We come finally to Philomela, who we chose for this, partly because it's a, it's a, it's a story in Ovid, and I won't bore you too much with it, you should look it up, um, where a woman is, is raped um, and threatens to speak out and the rapist cuts out her tongue and she says, never you mind, I will get the message to my sister. And she does by weaving a tapestry in which her entire adventure is um, written out, written out. And um, it is a supremely important story in, in, in uh, classical literature because it proves that women have ways of asserting power. And despite the, the, the physical power of men and the fact that everything in the world belonged to them, they could still find ways to control their circumstances, at least somewhat. Um, and I just wanted to say as a, a final message here um, about the background to this is that one of the most interesting women of the early modern period, Mary, Queen of Scots, um, was, uh, was a, a, a great embroiderer and she was held in detention by her cousin Elizabeth for, now I'm not going to remember, something like 15 years. And she made tapestries and on those tapestries were, were her rage and her anger. She chose a phoenix rising from the ashes as one of her images. And she has another one of, of a hand cutting the fruit off of vines. She wasn't a happy person. And finally, a motto, um, Wiriscit vulnere virtus, which means virtue flourishes by wounding. More or less, the more you do to me, the more virtuous I am, the better I am. Um, so it's an interesting, she is a, a very interesting figure. And again, her power was through tapestry and embroidery. Um, and it's, it's, it's a very common story in that period of time. Do you want to pick it up? Yeah, we'll do. Um, so there's actually um, four prints that employ text, and I'm going to just talk a little bit and highlight two of them. Um, so three of them actually combine text and paper, like the one that's on the left with that Philomela spoke the thread. Um, they all use uh, different types of paper, and I kind of thought of the paper as these physical uh, reciprocals for one's voice. But at the same time, for me anyway, that these images sort of seem to suggest other ways in which women actually had to find their voice. Um, the fourth image, which is the one on the right, uh, that focus, it focuses our attention really specifically on the digital stylus. Um, and then through Robin's text, this beautiful text about this sort of real substance and stuff of our life, um, and then this digital implement. I think that what I felt like we were starting to ask was 
how are our lives going to be preserved in this contemporary digital age? Mm -hmm. So I, I wanted to really show the video now, so I'm going to click over to it and um, I'm going to let it run. It's, a, it's just four minutes, but I really wanted to show it because I think that the video itself is really essential to the work. Um, for, for us, it sort of represents this internal consciousness and I think it really reinforces the premise of the prince. Um, it's Robin's story. Uh, she did the writing. Um, and it's really about being middle of age and acknowledging love and accepting death. So I'm gonna go ahead and play it. Oops, maybe. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Great, I'm gonna let it run.
So I'm going to pick it up a little bit, a little bit again, and talk some more about the prints that form part of the piece. Um, and uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about how they were made, um, and then how um, I painted over them. So first, the prints actually started out as analog collages um, that I did by. Uh, taking some textures I found either on the computer or things that I had around and I cut and paste and put them together. And then I scanned them all back into the computer and manipulated the color. Um, they're, they're actually matted as you can see in the earlier work or if you got a chance to see them at gallery or through the virtual gallery that they're actually matted to resemble book spreads. Uh, the orange shapes that you can see like the little curly cues <laughs> or the dot or the little squares on the left or the circles on the right are, um, are actually uh, repeated in another print but just rotated either left or right. Um, and then I did the same. I painted over all of them with gouache and I really wanted to do them because in a way I was inscribing them with this gestural signature. So to kind of finish us up, I wanted just to say that Philomela's thread, a uh, commonplace book, is actually the conceptual and intellectual, the intellectual counterpart to unspooling. Um, for in these prints, we are suggesting that what we have gained is our life experiences across the ages. So that's the end of our presentation. And I many things to Robin and to Penny for participating. Uh, it's been uh, an honor to work with you guys. It's our, my pleasure. Yeah, likewise. <laughs> so if there's any questions, by all means, please um, add, add them to the chat. Well, thank you for your kind comments. Yeah. Thank you. Any questions? Can we answer anything for you guys? No? Okay. <laughs> thank you thank again. I really appreciate your time, everybody. And thank you for contributing to the talk today. I really appreciate it. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.